Hi, I'm Femi OK, and you're in the stream. Today, can a new coronavirus be stopped? As global panic rises, we ask what's being done to prevent a pandemic. If you have comments or questions, you can tweet us and you can jump in our YouTube chat as well. And you also may well be in the stream. Tweet us as a resource today. At least 132 people have died in China and nearly 6,000 infected worldwide as a new coronavirus extends beyond the country's border. Health authorities say the outbreak originated in the city of Wuhan. While some people have been evacuated, many residents there are under lockdown while officials try and contain the virus. Many of those under that quarantine are fearful, including foreign college students. The government is not allowing the students or the citizens of the China. Uh, they cannot travel uh, to the other cities out from the Hubei. The reason of recording the video is that we are not safe here. I would like to request to our government, uh, Pakistan government, Pakistan embassy and the local government of China, please do something for us. Please, we want to go back to our countries. We want to meet our family. Uh, they are really worried. They are just crying all the day and they are also suffering with us. The World Health Organization has acknowledged the virus is an emergency in China but has stopped short of declaring it a global public health emergency. So what now? Here in our studio to discuss this, Ray Zong. She's a program associate at the Wilson Center, that's a non-partisan think tank in Washington DC and she also has family in Wuhan. In Taipei, Taiwan, journalist William Yang. He has been covering the outbreak for several international news outlets. And in Cambridge in the UK, Chris Smith. He's a virologist at the University of Cambridge. Hello, everybody. Thank you for helping us understand what is going on with the coronavirus. Chris, just behind me, there's an artist impression of the coronavirus. What do you see? Can you explain what this actually is? Coronaviruses are a common type of virus. They're common in humans. They're also common in animals. And to give it some scale, if I took a ruler and you imagine the first millimetre of that ruler, then I could pack about 10,000 of these viruses side by side into that first millimetre on the ruler. So they're really tiny particles. They, as viruses, grow in the nose and throat in an infected individual. In some cases, they make their way down into the lungs. And when we cough or sneeze, coughs and sneezes spread diseases. They spray out into the air. They come out in droplets and they hover in the air because they're so tiny. And then someone else walks along. They breathe in those droplets. They settle on the throat or the nose or the lung tissue of that other person. And the cycle repeats itself. And these viruses are so tiny because all they are is an infectious bag of genes. And what they want to do is to get into the cells that line our nose, throat and lungs and then hijack them and turn those cells into virus factories so they can then produce lots more virus, mm. make you ill in the process, but then spread to make other people ill after that. Right, so let me just show you this. This is um, a, a tweet here from Wuhan. People collapsing on the streets due to the deadly Wuhan pneumonia. That is what they called it on this particular tweet. Why would this virus kill you? How does it kill you? Well, whenever we catch a virus, the virus is using our cells to grow and to produce more viruses. But cells, because they are defending themselves against virus attack, are pretty good at detecting when viruses get into them. And they have effectively a burglar alarm built into the cell, which is a tripwire triggered by the virus growing. And when the virus triggers that tripwire, the cell sounds the chemical alarm by squirting out various hormones that attract the immune system. And when the immune system moves in to, to neutralize the invading virus and kill off the cells, mm. it causes inflammation. And if this is occurring in your lungs and you get very devastating inflammation in the lungs, the lungs don't work very well. And a person can therefore become asphyxiated. They can't get enough oxygen into their body and carbon dioxide out of their body. And this is what's causing some people to collapse. But it's a really broad range. And some oh. people are not getting these very dramatic symptoms. Some mm. are just getting very mild symptoms. And this is part of the problem because we can't see the wood for the trees here because the virus is producing symptoms very similar to a whole raft of other sure. seasonal disorders like the flu. And in some cases, it's becoming severe. In others, it's not. 
So right. it's very hard to spot who, who is really suffering and who isn't. Ray, uh, I know for sure that your family in Wuhan, they are suffering. Can you explain some of the stories that they are telling you and the way that you're keeping in contact with them? What's happening? Well, I do have an aunt who is working in one of Wuhan's biggest hospitals that has been sending us updates. She, like a lot of other medical personnel, have been working very long shifts. They're always keeping an eye on how many supplies they have and the load of patients that they're, they're handling with. Right now, I would say the main issue of the coronavirus is not just the virus itself, but the ability that medical personnel and the local government are able to handle the volume of people <clears throat> seeking diagnoses and treatment. That is the difference between life and death for a lot of coronavirus patients. So, uh, 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 Ray, a couple of things that you're sharing on your Twitter feed, which really helps us understand what is going on. Mm -hmm. uh, Santana says, I haven't slept well for days, knowing that I have friends, some heavily expectant, stuck in Wuhan, running out of food and medical supplies. They feel abandoned by a government, watching their foreign counterparts being evacuated. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about that. Well, Wuhan is a very large city. Its population is 11 million. It's actually three towns that were merged into one city. Um, and what's happening right now is that as the sudden city lockdown goes on, you have inconsistent availability of different resources, such as fresh produce, certainly equipment like face masks and mm -hmm. disinfectants. But as the quarantine goes on, this inconsistency of resources <clears throat> is going to make quality of life very spotty and inconsistent as well. William, how are you reporting this story? What's the most important headline that you've been, been sharing with the international audience so far? Uh, the most important headline is basically letting the world know how, in fact, uh, the whole epidemic could have been a lot less severe to how it is now if the government had, you know, uh, shared everything with the residents from the very beginning but the local residents felt like the government felt that. So uh, that's what led to the current situation in Wuhan and also even just in Hubei province where the city is located right now. Because basically the whole province right now is under uh, lockdown. Let me share this with you. Uh, Chris, I'm, I'm going to send this right to you. Uh, on YouTube, people are having this conversation, not just on YouTube, but elsewhere on social media. And the cause or ground zero of where this coronavirus came from. And uh, Strength of Shanghai says that eating bats and other unsavory creatures, this is their words, not mine, is the way to pathogens. Stop eating creatures like this. Does that make any difference? Tell us about that connection between animals and the coronavirus. Well, we take our lead here from 2002 to 2003, because back then, the virus SARS appeared on the world stage. That stands for the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, which is how people presented when they first succumbed to this mystery virus, which appeared in part of China in 2003. And it's really interesting that history appears to be repeating itself today because the mechanisms that we foresee underpinning this recent emergence of this new virus in Wuhan City are almost identical, we think, to what led to the appearance of SARS back then. Mm. What actually happened, we now know, because people did extremely detailed studies afterwards to trace the origin of SARS, was that they went hunting around and found in rural China a bat species, a rhinolophus bat. These are insectivorous bats that live in caves. They hunt down insects. People were bringing these bats to market, and these bats naturally harbour a coronavirus, and that coronavirus, we think, got into another animal in the market, in this case we think it was probably a civet cat, and because the civet cat is not the natural host of SARS, the civet cat is not able to fend it off, so it becomes really sick really quickly, and that means it gets really infectious. And anyone who then encountered the infectious uh, consignment of civet cats would have caught SARS. So we think there was this sort of bringing the foreign creature to market, putting it in the market next to another creature it would never normally rub up against in the wild, mm. and then enabling or facilitating a jump from one species to the next 
that then sure. enormously increase the amount of circulating virus. So people who encountered those animals right. were then almost guaranteed to get infected. And right. we think yes. that the same thing's happening again here. I would add to that, though, that at this point, the virus is communicable from person to person. And although authorities haven't concluded what the exact origins of the new coronavirus are, the issue in Hubei is that in December of 2019, the media outlet Caixin it started circulating reports that there might have been a coronavirus issue, but local government played down the potential harm of this. But by the time on January 23rd that Wuhan shut itself, people had already been transferring the virus via person-to-person -person contact. So um, despite the origin, the issue is person-to-person -person contact and the delay in the government essentially informing that it can be spread from person to person. All right. So right. Uh, yeah, William, go ahead. Go ahead, William. Yeah. So I, I, I think I just want to uh, re-emphasize more uh, what, what Ray just mentioned is that uh, so when the lockdown actually uh, was enforced, uh, the local basically felt like this is the government doing uh, too late and too little because uh, of the fact that there are already millions, as we know later, five million uh, people used, you know, living in Wuhan before the lockdown uh, happened. But then mm. at that time, the virus w was already spreading. Uh, so these people are already uh, spreading the virus to other parts of China or even uh, abroad. So that's one of the reason why they believe the government really failed to uh, you know, contain the virus in the beginning when it's still possible to limit it to a certain region, but right. not the whole China and even the world. Yes, let me just bring in Mohammed Munir, who talks about the way that the coronavirus is transmitted. Have a listen to him. Bats are reservoir um, for many viruses, and they are notorious to first infect an intermediate host before the viruses are fully adopted there and then transmitted to human. Since the Wuhan coronavirus was originated from a seafood market where meat for, from different animals were, uh, were sold, there are fair chances that the bats have transmitted the virus to some animals and then to human, as was the case in SARS coronavirus back in 2003. So let me just share this with you, Chris, and you can tell me. This is, this is from Ray's Twitter feed here, and Ray shares this about what the nurses of Wuhan Union Hospital are doing. They're cutting their hair short before starting work for a fever clinic on pneumonia ward. Long hair would likely catch virus. There's a lot of information out there, not all of it accurate. Would cutting your hair help prevent you catching the coronavirus? Where the virus needs to go is either into your eyes, up your nose or into your mouth and then down into your throat and into your lungs. Now, if you wander through an environment which has got lots of virus bobbing around in the air, yes, some could get stuck to your hair. It's more likely, though, that if there was enough to get stuck in your hair, it's probably gone up your nose and down your eyes and tear ducts already, I would say. So it might make a difference, but uh, shaving your hair, but the difference is going to be modest, to be honest. We promised our audience that we would ask you questions. So, William, I'm going to share this one with you. This is from David on Twitter. He says, in the quest to be first and promote content that galvanizes and holds an audience attention, might virus stories wind up getting distorted or exaggerated to make more interesting news or internet content? A little bit cynical there, William. What do you think about that, the media coverage of this coronavirus? I'd say so far, a lot of the uh, coverage is focused more on uh, how people are either suffering or how people are struggling to survive after the virus really uh, hit them very hard and also the response from the government and the policy from the government. So uh, the struggling part, I think it's been very consistent and also been very realistic about uh, how the lack of resources, especially medical supplies, are really putting a huge challenge to uh, the city, a city of nine million people right now uh, facing everyday uncertainty about uh, what they will be able to get uh, once they go out there, even fresh produce, even though now uh, it seems like all the fresh produce are back up, but uh, the more uh, worrying part is the fact that how long the city can sustain itself uh, without 
infecting more people with the lack of medical resources that are readily available out there for everyone in the city. Just to add on to what William just said, I think one of the issues with media coverage right now is the imp international implications of the coronavirus and how very specifically it's a virus that poses a lot more risk to people currently in Wuhan or Hubei than they are in the United States. There's, I think, single digits reported coronavirus patients in the United States. But if you're in the U.S., you can go to a hospital and you won't have to stand in line for a couple of hours to get treated. You won't have to worry about diagnostic equipment or masks necessarily running short. In Hubei, those are very real mm. problems, and they're constant problems right now. Chris, this is Vicky Haynes. She's on YouTube watching us right now. She wants to know, is the virus still mutating? You can see her right here in the orange on our, on our uh, YouTube page. Where are we right now with the coronavirus? Can you even Hello, get Vicky. that information yet? Yeah, uh, the answer is that all viruses can mutate, and coronaviruses are no exception. And the way that they mutate is that they introduce genetic spelling mistakes into the genetic information in which the virus stores the recipe to make more viruses. And when the viruses grow in cells, they occasionally do make these mistakes. Some viruses make more mistakes than others. And so as they go through a series of hosts, they can change by mm -hmm. making these mistakes because the mistakes change the recipe and the recipe change the, changes the way the virus looks. Now... What is undoubtedly going to happen here is that you've got a virus which has come from an animal, a bat, gone into humans, which are not bats, obviously, and human cells work a bit differently to bat cells. So slowly the virus will change to adapt to work better in a human <coughs> cell. And in the process of doing that, sometimes the virus surrenders something. Sometimes it surrenders its virulence. So the first time viruses move into a new type of host, they're often much nastier than once they adapt to that host, because ah. it's not in the interest of the virus to kill off its host too quickly or to kill too many hosts, because then it wouldn't have any hosts. That, so usually Chris, there's an equilibrium that's reached. Do you mind if, you mind if I ask a, reached. ask a question? Is that, does, does that mean that the, the more people that are infected by the coronavirus, the less severe it will become? Potentially. Because ah. if we look at, say, the, the bat that's got this virus, the yeah. bat has evolved to fight off this virus or to live with it as its natural host and the virus has evolved to live in that bat species. There's another good example which mm. is that when people sought to tackle the rabbit problem in Australia because early settlers in Australia took rabbits for sport, there are now about 200 billion rabbits in Australia, yeah. they thought the solution would be let's infect them with myxomatosis, quite a different virus but the principles are identical. In the first year of introducing myxomatosis to rabbits it killed more than 99.9% .9 of the rabbits that caught it but within a couple of years that number was down to about two thirds or half and it's now under half. So in other words, the virus has become much less nasty towards rabbits, and the rabbits have also become better at tolerating being infected Chris, with it. So is, is that, your, is that your positive story there, about 98% of rabbits being killed off and we're talking about the coronavirus? Uh, thank you for no, scaring I'm trying, us. I'm trying, to explain, I'm trying to explain to you how yeah. the mechanisms work. So when you first see a new virus moving it's into a very population, severe. you're going to see Got potentially it. a more severe manifestation than once it's adapted and once the population have adapted to it. Understood. Uh, Ray, let me share this with you. I'm sure you've probably seen it already uh, online. Uh, no face mask, no problem. Use whatever work safety first. I know that face masks are being used um, extensively in Wuhan right now. Mm -hmm. uh, what are people being told about how to stop transmission? Are they told to wear, wear face masks? Why are they told to wear face masks? This gentleman's gone that extra step. I think he's wearing a face mask and a water bottle over his head. Uh, some people found that quite amusing, but it does show the, the level of fear that is surrounding this crisis. Well, there's certainly a lot of concerns over supply shortages, but face masks, specifically one called N95 face masks, uh -huh. are the ones that have been shown to be best at preventing uh, the spread of diseases. Those are in kind of short supply. Also hand washing mm -hmm. and um, early detection, I think, has been key. And the hospital that my aunt works at is developing uh, ways to speed up the ability for people to see a doctor or detect 
symptoms that may surface. Mm. Uh, William, let's look at preventative measures um, and tackling the coronavirus. What are you reporting? What are you hearing? For instance, here I'm on travel.state.gov, China travel advisory here in the United States. Reconsider travel to China due to novel coronavirus first identified in Wuhan, China. What else are you seeing that might actually be quite useful in terms of stopping the spread of this coronavirus? I think it's just, uh, again, the fact that making sure you are protecting yourself if you are going to regions or areas where uh, it's actually going to have a high risk of uh, in coming in contact with people either carrying the virus or uh, already infected. And also the fact that uh, just make sure that you follow up with a lot of the uh, travel alerts uh, that are issued by either your government or also uh, keep up with what actually has been uh, updated uh, in, in, from, from, from World Health Organizations or even just uh, your government agencies because uh, those are now every, basically every government is uh, like follow up and uh, very updated and keeping a very close eye on what's actually coming out. So uh, these are the things that uh, have been shared a lot, mm -hmm. actually, uh, with people around the world who are either going to China or passing through China or even just taking the plane. Right. Ray, you, a, a lot of the conversation internationally has been about how is China dealing with this coronavirus, this health emergency? Mm -hmm. But you see it in a different way. You see it as a regional mm -hmm. problem, not a national issue. Experiencing this as someone who was born in Wuhan and still hold, holds, it, having the city hold a lot of value, it is really sad seeing some of the things that are happening. There are villages in China that are building barriers and saying people from Hubei stay out. People who went on vacation, not getting informed by their government, are now being kicked out of hotels and maybe forced out of places that they've been traveled to. There's a lot of disinformation on how the virus spreads that's been hitting people from Wuhan pretty hard. And so all of this is happening in conjunction with the frustration that the people of Wuhan and Hubei have mm -hmm. in terms of the time delay of how they were informed about the coronavirus. Chris, let me just show you, and this is very briefly because we're right at the very end of the show, so I'd I love a brief response if that's possible. Dr. Tedros is the head of the WHO, the World Health Organization. They had a news conference today, and they are going to have another one tomorrow. What I gather from their news conferences, they're still trying to work out what is going on, how serious the coronavirus is. How is the WHO handling this health emergency so far? in your opinion? Well, I think the WHO are doing everything they can. And really, China has improved its act because when SARS happened, they didn't tell anybody about that for six months. And that's why it got to 8,000 people and there were 800 deaths. This time, they were quicker off the mark. They identified their first case on the 1st of December. They told the WHO on the 1st of January. But we're still very sceptical about how much the, we can trust the information that's emerging and the rate at which it's being dispensed. And they're response does appear to be a bit disproportionate to what they're saying and what we're being told. Mm -hmm. Why do you, for instance, suddenly decide to build two very large hospitals and construct them in under two weeks if you're seeing the sort of level of lethality that we're seeing here? So it, it argues that perhaps this is hitting a lot harder than we're being led to believe. And one wonders whether China are being cautious with how they let the information go because they're concerned about the economic impact of this and they don't want it to dent the country's fairly fragile economic state because if they see their economic productivity fall, then the, the country actually, unless it's growing at a ferocious rate, is in recession. Mm. Thank you so much, Chris. You really helped us understand a lot more about the coronavirus. We're all learning about it together, but you have definite insight, and we really appreciate that. William, thank you for telling us about your reporting. And Ray, thank you for telling us about what is happening in Wuhan and giving us the regional perspective, mm -hmm. which is so very important. And for your questions, our online community appreciate that, and for you joining us on YouTube and on TV. We continue to follow this story in aljazeera.com. Have a look here. It's a coronavirus outbreak news and there is plenty of information to keep you informed all through this health emergency. Thanks for watching. Take care.